primary criticisms of corrections is that it doesn't work. It doesn't keep people in prison long enough, it doesn't punish people harshly enough, and it doesn't rehabilitate people. What does it do? It gives prisoners too many amenities, such as books and weightlifting and TV, and it releases people too early, among other things. Instead of talking about what prison does or doesn't do, I thought it would be useful to look at the literature on what corrections has been empirically proven to do. This is called evidence-based corrections. The concept of using evidence to drive decision-making comes from the medical field. In medicine, doctors are constantly looking at what others have done, assess accessing and assessing data that they've generated, and modeling treatment regimens based on best practice. Within the last 20 years or so, the criminal justice field has begun to do the same things, particularly in corrections. Evidence-based practices, or EBP, are those policies and practices that are based on empirical evidence of what works and what doesn't. Practitioners use research generated by academics and others to drive policy and practice in prisons, probation, and parole. This allows practitioners to create and develop programs that are based on knowledge and not somebody's wishes or whims. A basic premise is that everyone is different. People learn differently, people react differently, and people behave differently. Nowhere do we see this more aptly displayed than with children. We wouldn't dream of treating all children the same. They learn differently, they're visual learners, they write things down, or they learn by doing. Why then do we or would we think that offenders, or adults for that matter, are any different? Evidence-based practice is another way of informing us of the particular circumstances under which offenders have the best chance of succeeding. And what I mean by that is not recidivating. And isn't that really the goal anyway? One aspect of EBP that has gained significant momentum in the last decade or so is the area of risk needs assessment. If everyone learns differently, responds to treatment in different ways, then we can maximize their success in a program by putting them in a program that is best tailored to meet their needs. We do this by assessing the risks that offenders pose to themselves and others, and by identifying their needs, such as substance abuse, mental health, housing, employment, etc. And when we do that, and by directly assessing those needs, we do so in an effective way. When we address offender needs and we are able to reduce the risk that they pose because of this, we are addressing the dynamic factors or criminogenic needs. The hallmark of effective risk needs assessment is the ability to reduce risk. When we reduce risk, we reduce recidivism. I encourage all of you to read or seek out information on the principles of effective intervention, the risk, needs, and responsivity principles. These principles were developed by several Canadian scholars and have become the hallmark of Canadian correctional practice. In the United States, we have only recently, in the last decade or so, begun to incorporate these principles into our work. How might Robert Martinson have reacted to these, do you think? The readings that you will explore in week four and five will touch on EBP, risk needs assessment, and institutional and community-based programming and how they attempt to manage offenders. Corrections isn't just about locking people up. The field of corrections also involves keeping people out of prison in the first place, probation, and managing, managing them once they leave. That would be parole. There are a series of in-between programs that also exist that, if used based on offender risk and need, can and do reduce recidivism. I'm talking about programs such as halfway houses, outpatient drug and mental health treatment, and the like. At the end of the day, whether people are incarcerated or not, it makes no sense to adopt a one-size-fits-all approach to dealing with people who are not the same. Just because they've committed a crime doesn't make them all the same. How we address the risks and needs of offenders in prison, and inside and out, can have a dramatic impact on whether or not they commit crime again. Imagine a world where we might be able to reduce recidivism rather than fight it. 